You know, performance can change you in the way that art can't, because it's a life energy, and that life energy is exchanged between the performer and the audience, which is so specific and so special. Hi, I'm Andrew Goldstein, and this is The Art Inc., a podcast from Artnet News, where the art world meets the real world, bringing each week's biggest story down to earth. These days, as contemporary art continues to pervade pop culture, there are art stars, i.e. the talents who captivate the attention of art professionals, and then there are art superstars, the handful of figures who have broken through to legitimate actual fame, winning a spot in the minds of the public at large. If you ask me, the most appealing of all of these titans is Marina Abramovich, the high priestess of performance art, whose unforgettable work plums eternal profound themes of life and death, whose impact on art history is huge and undeniable, but who is nonetheless, in person, just a lovely, brilliant, hilarious, vivacious human being. Given her biography, that might not be what you'd expect. Growing up the child of two emotionally cold war hero parents in Belgrade, she developed a particularly arduous strain of performance art and fought an uphill battle for most of her astonishing five-decade career in an art world that gave practically no support, institutional or financial, to her chosen medium of performance. Her closest artistic collaborator, her longtime lover, Ule, betrayed her in spectacular fashion in a way that has entered art history, and then, after they reconciled years later, sued her. But despite all of this, when success came, such as with her 1997 Golden Lion win at the Venice Biennale, and then her blockbuster 2010 survey at MoMA, what has been most palpable is her enormous enjoyment of her career and its accomplishments. Now, that career is about to once again be surveyed in an oeuvre-spanning show at Sean Kelly Gallery in New York. To talk about her work, I am very happy to have Marina Bromwich on the show today. Thank you very much for coming on The Art Angle, Marina. Thank you for having me. As I said, I'm constantly misspelling the art angle to art angel. So let's talk to angels tonight. <laughs> Wait. I guess we do try to be art angels around here. Uh, Where are you zooming in from right now? Right now, I just came back from Europe, and I am uh, here in New York in my apartment. And after this uh, talk to you, I'm going to Sean Kelly because we're installing the new show. So lots to do till this week. You know, that kind of raises a very trite question, but I was just re-watching The Artist is Present last night, and I was noticing that your apartment has this beautiful decor with this kind of robin's egg, greenish-blue paneling. Where does this color come from? Ah, but that apartment that you saw don't exist anymore. I left and moved to another place. And the floor in this apartment, it was just gray concrete, and I literally painted into kind of turquoise, Turkish turquoise color who look like a swimming pool. But I love it. I love colors in my life. You know, it's very important. Cities are always gray. So the color is kind of bring up your energy and enthusiasm. You know, I always think it's great to have a very bright yellow wall to look at it if there is no sun. I think that this might be something that's actually surprising to some of your fans, given that, you know, aside from your splendid red dress in The Artist is Present, you really are very much associated with black. So I think it's interesting that in your own private places, you really embrace color. Just to talk about this dress, you know, nothing is just by accident. You know, I had the three dresses for the artist is present, and they're very particular, and they're very specially, you know, chosen. You know, they are all very long and very thick, so that you can keep me from the wind and cold of the atrium. But also, a part of that, there is something to do with energy. In the first months, I had a dark blue dress, and dark blue dress is really to make you calm and concentrated. Then the second month was extremely difficult sitting on that chair for so many hours, so I needed energy, so I had a really strong red dress. And then the third month was, you know, kind of resolve all these pains and, and, uh, and the kind of effort into various feeling of peace and tranquility. And then I had the white dress. So actually there are three energies, you know, blue, red, white. They're not just there for decoration. They really had a very meaningful effect on my state of being. Well, I definitely have a bunch of questions for you about your MoMA show. But to begin, let's go back to your very first performance, Rhythm 10, which is part of your Sean Kelly show. 
you play the so-called Russian game, outstretching your hand and rapidly stabbing a knife between your fingers until you cut yourself, only do it 20 times with 20 different knives, and then do it all over again. This inaugurated the quintessential mode of your work, which is doing durational performances of acts that require superhuman physical stamina and or cause pain. You've said that only in recent years have you truly understood the meaning of durational performance. So what does durational performance mean to you and what makes it so powerful? You know, durational performance, it's a huge discovery in my career, in my early, early years, in the early 70s. My performances was mostly one hour. It was also very much to do with the timing with the videotapes, which was one hour and I want to record it. And then later on, I felt insufficient and I was kind of extending time to more, two hours, three hours, four hours, six hours, and so on. And the longer the hours became, I understand the value of long durational performance because you literally go through physical and mental transformation. And then when I came to the point like in MoMA of three months, uh, this transformation was enormous, but not just mine, but also the palgi itself. You know, people will come in the beginning to see the work and they would just stay for short and then will stay longer and then they could not believe I'm still there. They will bring the friends and the friends will bring the friends. Actually, the 36 guards of the Museum of Modern Art went to their homes, changed their uniforms, and come on the weekend and wait in the line to sit with me. I knew something else is happening here. It was that kind of community support that I needed to complete this piece. And then when I stand up from that chair, I was different. Something changed dramatically. And uh, I understand the long durational performance for me and for community of the people watching the art public. It's essential. And now in my institute, which is Marina Bramovich Institute, my, I teach you know, very young artists and prepare them for long durational work because everything is different, especially if you come to the museum. You know, mostly the performance was always seen as entertainment. People would do something one hour, there will be dinner, there will be, you know, people standing with the drinks, looking at the piece, talking. But when you go to the museum, an entire museum is all living work. Energy is incredible. Everything changed. I had this young artist, you know, in the Benaki Museum in, in Athens, and she came with this idea. It was unbelievable. The show was two months, and the museum is open every day at eight hours because every museum is open from 10 to 6. That's why this eight hours is important. So she came with the idea to count the seconds. I mean, seconds. This is insane. Of course, she needs preparation. We made a preparation with her that she can have, a, you know, willpower, the stamina and all that. And finally, she started. And when she started, this was one of the most charismatic moments that what happened with the audience. In the beginning, there was disbelief. And then the audience started coming more and more and more. And the last 20 days of this second month of performance, literally all public was counting seconds with her. It was just that total support. It was something different. You know, performance can change you in the way that art can't because it's a life energy. And that life energy is exchanged between the performer and the audience, which is so specific and so special. You know, I think it's also an interesting place where two key elements of art merge. One of them is value. You were talking about the value of durational performance. If you go to an art fair, people say, the artist worked on this painting for an entire year. And then that painting has more value because it's actually invested with the most precious commodity that artists can bring to the table, which is their time. And then durational performance also has a spiritual aspect where if you look at somebody like Gandhi fasting for a period of time and galvanizing the entire attention of the world, I wonder, do you think those two aspects of the spiritual and also the endowment of value come together in durational performance? Yeah, absolutely. There's so many aspects, you know, and I also think just general performance, but also any other form of art have to have so much the layers of meaning, you know, have to be social and have to be dealing with community and have to be the physical and mental and spiritual and political and all together. And then I think that have this, so much layers of meaning, the one work of art, then have the actually possibility that every society in the need take the layers they need at the time. And that kind of art can a long life, you know. If it's just political, it's just uh, spiritual, it's not enough. You have to have lots of elements inside one work that actually is able to exist and to survive 
But I only know that the good work of art actually have many lives and doesn't matter if it was not accepted by the society you live in. It doesn't matter because there will be always in future something that will click in. Hmm. So after Rhythm 10, you built this extraordinary body of work that encompassed both your 12-year romantic and artistic collaboration with Ule, and you also had far more solo work, including your extraordinary Balkan Baroque, which won the Golden Lion at the Venice Biennale in 1997. Then in 2010, your world and the art world both changed with your retrospective at MoMA, The Artist is Present. If you can think back, what was your life and career like before that show? It, it was hugely different. First of all, entire MoMA show I made with one assistant. That was it, you know. It was unthinkable. Now, in the middle career, artists have at least 12 assistants. I still don't have 12. I have three. <laughs> but everything was changing. You know, if you think about early 70s, if you have five friends to see you peace, you're happy. Ten is like, wow. And the 30 was huge crowd. You know, you don't even know how you're going to manage. And then, you know, start changing and we have more and more public but still performance was you know not mainstream art and whatever you've been doing this always was non-mainstream video and photography very very fast became mainstream but not performance it was always seen some kind of outcast and then one point you know i made the seven easy pieces guggenheim which took me 12 years to get permission finally to do it there and after success of that seven easy pieces and House with Ocean View with Sean Kelly Gallery, you know, the MoMA uh, was so criticized, they are not showing enough avant-garde art or contemporary art. They say, let's do the show with her. And I remember that this belief when Klaus Biesenbach came with the title, Artist is Present, and we're going to show only the work that I am present, which is only basically all the work <laughs> is photography or, you know, the video and uh, also showing the re-performance elements, which never done before. But then I say, if the show is called Artist is Present, I'm going to be present there entire time. But then he said, sitting in the chair in the front with another chair, but this chair will be empty. You know, this is New York. Nobody have any time. I said, it doesn't matter. I'm going to sit anyway. So empty chair, not empty chair. I want to be present. You know, in the old days, when you have an exhibition of the painting and on the invitation is written, Artist is Present, but means for the opening. But this time I say, okay, I want to have opportunity to show the power and transformation of performance art with an incredible minimal, actually, action, almost nothing, just being still in the atrium space, and that's it, and see what will happen. And then miracle happened. And we had 850,000 people for living artists. This was an incredible record. And then everything changed, you know. American public is interesting. First, they ignore you, then they discover you, and they are very happy to discover you, and then you become celebrity, and then they absolutely criticize you for that. <laughs> and, and this is like, you know, not my choice. I'm always the same. You know, the way how the public perceive you and how they judge you. It's quite interesting. And then it comes and goes, you know. And I had uh, so many bad criticism in my 70s. If I read this seriously and take in consideration, I would never leave the house. And then after this MoMA show, it was good criticism. And then whatever i done after, it was a bad, an attack on me. And then came biography and there was another attack. And, you know, it comes and goes. All I have to do is to do my work as best as I can. But now it's 50 years later. I am much more immune to all this. I mean, it's a very interesting point you bring up about how, I don't know if it's human culture, but America definitely loves to lift up its heroes and then get tired of playing with them and destroy them. And, you know, some people in the political world call this the news cycle. You wait it out, you, you try to ride the wave up, and then you try to, you know, wait out the downslope. So how have you learned to navigate these cycles of reaction to your work? You know, I love human beings, generally. And one of the things, things would really happen in MoMA show, in the artist is present, this is kind of strange to talk about, but I experience literally unconditional love for every single stranger sitting in the front of me. Incredible compassion. And this was very, very important. And that stays with me. And this is why probably I have such understanding with very young public and not with my generation at all. This has been always the case. You know, whenever I come to give a speech, I will ask, who is the youngest person there? There will be 
anybody from 12 years old, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, till 35. Who is the oldest? The oldest will be 55, nobody above that. <laughs> and and uh, this really gave me lots of uh, hope that my work, if the young audience understand, is going to have longer life. Huh. Why do you think that is? Why do you think your work resonates so much with a younger audience? First of all, that I show not just my strengths, but my vulnerability. I show them all aspects of myself and I don't lie. You know, I, I don't have secrets basically because I just write about everything and I make work out of everything. And the young people can relate to the truth. They can feel something is fake or something is real. In my case, everything is real. This is why after biography, I have so many people who don't talk to me because I tell the truth. <laughs> Very difficult. But I dedicate to my book to the friends and enemies. So many friends became enemies. Some enemies became friends. Things change. goes up and down. Obviously, barrels and barrels of ink have been spilled on the artist as present. But to me, it somehow seems like a still underappreciated hinge moment in terms of how art operates in the broader culture. It utterly transformed the place of performance art in the art world by taking it from the margins of the underground to the center of the establishment, literally in the case of MoMA, which after it reopened in 2019 with a $400 million makeover, it put a dedicated performance space right in the heart of the building. One reason was because it clearly could draw crowds, meaning big bucks. Another reason was that your invention of re-performance meant that performance art could be a reliable medium for exhibition, that it was shelf-stable, as it were. So what does the fact that you took performance art mainstream mean to you? You know, means a lot. You know, if I die like this second <laughs> during this podcast and I'm thinking back to my life and what I really achieve, you know, and now I'm 75, so it's not just the little age. I'm really thinking that I'm very responsible for putting the performance into mainstream art. I am very responsible for a creating idea of re-performance that the historical pieces from the artists from the 70s can be re-performed. I also, when I'm making my institute and creating possibilities for young artists to learn how to perform and to create something which I call Abramovich Method. That Abramovich Method is not just for the artists, but also for the public and general people. It can be anybody from the worker in the factory to the politician that can be benefit from Abramovich Method system. So there are some kind of things that I think I'm proud of it. But it's very important to be mainstream because it's such an important form of art that actually didn't been overseen well. Now things are different. Now that I think that, as I said, you know, it's a life energy, it's a time-based art, and can be transformative to the audience when performance is good. Now, speaking of the mainstream, after the artist is present, you entered a new phase where you were a celebrity, a literal celebrity, and more importantly, a celebrity magnet. Nowadays, when you see movie stars walking around Freeze LA, it's par for the course. But back then, when suddenly you had James Franco, Lady Gaga, and Jay-Z all trying to collaborate with you, it was a very, very new thing. You got a lot of flack for it at the time, but you were really very bold, actually, for taking these opportunities on and stepping into the mass pop culture spotlight, which is rare for an artist and almost unprecedented for a female artist. What appealed to you about these famous people and their massive audiences, and what did you learn about celebrity during this time? You know, I don't give a shit about all this, to tell you the truth, because mm -hmm. to me, it's not why I'm doing art. For me, this important content and message and how I can live the human spirits. Like I have the lecture when I went to my own country in Belgrade, and for that lecture, they could not be done in the museum because it was too small. They had it on the field and 6,000 people came. And I don't know how many artists talk to 6,000 people. That's kind of huge a number. And I felt that the people are really there to listen to what I have to say. So it's not about being celebrity, why they're coming. It's they're coming there because I have something to give to them. And that's what is really important. Celebrity is just a side effect. Money is just a side effect. But it's not the reason why you're doing the art. You're doing the art because it's like a breathing. You don't question the breathing. You breathe and otherwise you die. And art is the urge, necessity to create. 
I think part of the reaction to this celebrity has been that the art world likes its performance artists to be poor and obscure. And when you're really standing in the middle of the public sphere and commanding it, I think that that's an unexpected place for performance artists, especially female performance artists. You know, the two articles very recent for the my big show in Listen Gallery in, in London, and then another article just last week about the release of these cards that I made, Abramovich Method. Mm -hmm. So they're very big articles. You know, we're talking two pages, three pages, cover, stuff like that, no small. But the, the one thing that's interesting, the people who interview me, they're really people from art criticism or their writers, and this is a good good article. But the people who made the titles are not the same who write the article. So that's what is incredible, how the every single title of that article is so horrible, so kind of disgusting, so in many ways putting you down, especially as a female artist. So the first one in Guardian in October was an article about my show. The title was Marina Bramovic, Love, Young Lover, Dirty Jokes, and Mystical Crystals. This was the title. It's, it's the most vulgar, the banal, and nothing to do with my work at all. Second one just came, you know, like, like last week. It's called Culture, and then it's her next trick. Marina Abramovic, artist, provocateur, self-help guru. And then really serious article after that, but this is the title. And I am so fed up with this. Whatever you do, they will punch you in the stomach, you know. They just can't talk about something. Maybe it's good. Maybe I have talent. Maybe my work means something. Maybe people react very strongly on me. They can't deal with that. They can't. And then fashion. This is another thing. I am on the covers of few fashion, actually quite many fashion magazines. And I, you know, being on 75 in the cover of fashion magazines, I love it. I have fun doing it. The people give me clothes. What's wrong with this? I also do good art too. And why artists have to have any of this kind of restrictions and limits? I just done opera, which I'm showing Sean Kelly Gallery, the video of this. You know, 10 years ago, somebody told me, you're doing opera, you're crazy because, you know, it's such a kind of old-fashioned art form. But I made something new out of it. And uh, why not? Artists have to be free human spirit. And I'm doing it, breaking whatever rules. Who make the rules? Who make the limits? That's the question. And now today you have the Abramovich Method, which I think is inspiring a whole new generation. It makes a lot of your teachings, your philosophy, very accessible, from the cards that you've recently debuted to the digital version of the Abramovich Method that you did with WeTransfer. So what is the Abramovich method and where does it come from? So, you know, I took actually entire planet as a studio and I travel everywhere. I spent more than 25 years with the Tibetan communities in monasteries and doing retreats with the Tibetan monks. I spent lots of time in Australia with Australian Aborigines which I learned from them so much. They're exquisite. They're, they're for me, people who actually should be treated as uh, living treasures like I do in Japan. Then I spent time in uh, Amazon with the shamans from there. So all of these people, I learned parts and exercise certain things to understand how I can push my physical mental limits on my body that I can use in performance. And then from some of this and on my own, also the kind of inventions, I create a Bramwich method who can actually serve to other people. I mean, one simple exercise, which was really people was using the COVID, is just go outside in the nature and pick up one tree and hug the tree and complain to tree at least 15 minutes. People was going and complaining the trees and crying and holding the trees. And there was some kind of connection they had with nature that was so important in the time of COVID. And you know how we are developing with technology and how we are completely getting invalids that technology replaces our life. We're going to get lost if we don't go back to simplicity. Abramovich method is going back to simplicity, you know, looking into your own energy, your own intuition, who you are, asking main questions. And with simple exercises, you can achieve peace of mind. Back in the 1970s, when you were first emerging as an artist, life-enhancing methods like Werner Erhardt's Est were incredibly popular all over the world. Now they are rare. What makes you think the world needs the Abramovich method today? Look at our children, how sad it is. Our children don't read the books anymore. They're just looking video games. 
detect each other, they don't see each other. It's such alienation of the human emotions. Technology was invented that human beings have more time for himself. But human being is afraid to have time for himself. And Abramovich method is showing you possibilities that actually you can have time with yourself and you can use time usefully to understand so many levels of your consciousness. Speaking of mass movements, you know, in the fall of 2020, when the world had gone mad and QAnon was mixing with Trumpism to fill headlines with just stunning numbers of perversely inventive conspiracy theories, including one about you being a high priestess of a satanic Democrat child abuse cult, an absurd situation that we discussed on an earlier Art Angle episode, you said that you were reconsidering making your home in the United States, where you've lived for a long time. So how are you feeling about America and your place in this country these days? <laughs> it would be wonderful if politicians could read Gandhi biography and learn something from there. You know, nothing can change if you don't change your consciousness. And by changing your consciousness, you can change others. And this is the problem. It's motivation, consciousness, who these people are, who are the politicians, what are the moral values. Do you feel like you could do the artist as present in today's America? considering how vulnerable you have to be and how accessible you are to the audience? Yeah, I think that it's just not about artists as present. I think that any kind of human communication and being honest and vulnerable and truth and in relation to the public is so important for the public to grow and to change. And I really think that art have this possibility. It's art is not about transform you. And the art is asking the right questions, not giving always answers. But it's very important for the spiritual growth. It's necessary. Art is like, as I say, as a breathing. You, you have to, how you call the upgrade yourself with reading beautiful book, reading the poem, looking the piece of architecture, seeing good performance in theater, looking the cinema. All of these things is a part that how we can grow as a human being. We can say so many bad things or good things about American culture, but I always like to see global picture. To me, if you look the world in the centuries and thousands of years, not much change, only that we have different names for the wars. It was a civil war, it was first war, the second war, there's going to be nuclear war, there's going to be this, but it's always wars. It's always somewhere somebody killing somebody. It's always somebody's hungry. It's always this sickness. It's always this epidemic. You know, the pest was 15 years in the 15th century. That's how long it was staying at that time. And then comes and goes. Humanity don't really change. They don't learn from the past. That's the problem. But we are living in this tiny little blue planet, which we call Earth. And we see that in universe. We are not even in the middle of the Milky Way. We are in the suburb of the Milky Way. We are in the Brooklyn of Milky Way, somewhere, whatever. And, you know, any asteroid, any comet can come in and destroy us any second. And we are so arrogant. And we live, you know, like we are there forever. And we are not. We will come and go. And this is why I don't care about is American culture, is this culture, is that. It's just look the globally, the planet. We need to see globally what we are doing to this planet and how we are destroying our own place to live. This is why I call my, my workshops also cleaning the house. It's not important to clean your home, like, you know, apartment. What you have to clean is yourself, your own house. And when you clean your own house, you will see things differently about the planet, about Earth, about the universe. It's interesting that at this moment, when people are very dangerously underappreciating the planet that they live in, we're also spending enormous amounts of resources to create a virtual world that you can leave the in-person reality to go to in a virtual reality in the metaverse. And you've been experimenting with this space. In fact, you did your first piece of mixed reality performance art in 2020, a work called The Life that you created with your producer, partner, Todd Eckhart. And this was more than a year before the rest of the world became even aware of the metaverse. So what do you think the promise is that the metaverse holds for you and your art? And what does it hold for art writ large? The people asking me, oh, your work is so great to make NFT. You have to make NFT. That even somebody was asking me if I can make NFT for my soul and sell it. <laughs> I, 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 but, you know, I have to say that I never see really good product out of this. All what I see is talking about money. But money to me is not, you know, enough 
It's, it's about meaning of the work. I never see anything really good out of this. Or at the same time, I don't want to be close into this whole thing. I think you have to have open mind because I'm always interested in everything new. And I'm not the somebody from my generation who say only my life was good in the time in the past and now everything is shit. I don't say that. But I didn't see anything that really excited me. And I still don't have enough knowledge that I can talk about it. I mean, in terms of money, I was astonished to find in preparing for this episode that your mixed reality work, The Life, actually is your highest earning artwork at auction, selling for $376,000 in 2020, which I was kind of shocked by. But you know, it's very funny that this was how much was sold for. But to make it, we spent $1,200,000 to be made. (laughs) Wow. <laughs> so, because it's incredible, it's a new technology, you have to invent everything, and it's so difficult, and, and you know, you have to have lots of sponsors to put money, so we hardly could pay sponsors, it's still we're in debit. Again, not about money, for me it was about how you can actually touch the idea of immateriality and create something that can exist once you're not there and be more present than the just video projection because it's 36 cameras and not just one. And that was what is interesting, you know, to me, that kind of aspect. That was all experiment. I also invest my own money to make this. It was not paying back any of this, but it was important that exists. And I call the life, really the life. You know, I would like to do more in this direction things and to see, you know, but it's expensive experiments (laughs) to say. Do you feel that some of the energy from performance art that you unleashed into the mainstream with your MoMA show has been transmuted into this new craze for high-tech immersive experiences like the Van Gogh experience, the Frida Kahlo experience, etc.? Well, but this is more spectacular things, you know. I am very much interested in human energy itself and what one human can do in the front of audience by himself and using the all energy of what he possess more than kind of big spectacles. That's the, what I, I'm really looking forward to. And I just was reading the, in the news, what is the name? That, she's only 20 now, this amazing singer, Billy Eli, Ellis. Billy Eilish, okay. And I'm very interested to actually see her because I never saw live performing, but the article is very interesting because the articles say the only show of this spectacle is herself that actually she kind of stripped the whole thing about, you know, mumbo jumbo, big projections, lights and everything to simple brother doing the, the instrument and one drummer and herself in Covent Garden, which is always, you have to have the kind of big events with the lots of background stuff. And she just relay on her own energy. And it's kind of interesting. I want to see her. So now that we're hopefully knock on wood coming out of the pandemic, how do you think the in-person art world will be different when it comes back to life and what are you looking forward to the most? I don't know if it's different, you know, it's, it's very early to say, but to me it's really important that we become more humble. Humble is such a good thing to go and somehow also to realize that you're not there forever and to really stop having art just for commodity. This is something which really drives me crazy, that art became such a commodity, but performance never came commodity. This is why I like performance, you know, you can't make art a performance commodity, even if you want to. It's kind of escape that kind of term. And it's so funny when economical, you know, society is suffering economical crisis, then performance art come up. When economy goes stronger, then the performance go down and the other part of art go up and become this huge prices on the different auctions and change, you know. And do you want to spend more time in the city when the pandemic subsides, or do you want to spend more time up in the country, in nature, where you have a house? I really love the, some kind of to understand how much we need nature, but also how much we need a city. And I really think that it's going to be probably lots of parties and lots of people start getting happy, more happy than this whole crisis brings so much sadness. So many divorces, so many people die. That We need some happy moments. We need something to really live in the moment and enjoy every day as last. That is absolutely necessary because that can come any minute. This is something that I'm aware since I was 17 and that actually understanding that you actually live more happy life and you cut the bullshit out of your life that everything that is not necessary, just kind of go back to simplicity. I'm always for that.
let's have more and more of less and less. Well, I think that is a wonderful note to end on. Thank you very much for coming on the show, Marina. It's nice talking to you. I enjoyed. You know, I really did. That's it for this week's episode of The Art Angle. If you like what you heard, you can subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else you get your podcasts. Also, take a moment to rate and review us. It will help other listeners discover what we're doing. The Art Angle is produced by Sonia Manalili, Tim Schneider, and Caroline Goldstein. Thanks for listening, and see you next week.